I'm just so grateful for this opportunity to talk about the epic a little in my own uh, practice. So thank you both. And this um, great that they included the long poem this year. So you often find your form, your stride for particular kinds of writing, one that feels true to the rhythms of your own consciousness and metabolism in the world, or allows a kind of freedom and expansion of intellect and imagination. The long poem has been mine for a variety of reasons and taken many forms, epic, allegory, investigative hybrid in chapters or cantos, libretto, an architecture based on a traditional Buddhist mon monument, a memorial uh, marker or stupa, as it's called, and uh, while including other strategies, like such as the, the Barobador poem, the stupa poem, and this recent allegory, I particularly like to focus or highlight the epic coast, the epic uh, in this forum. Writing long poems and reading them as well is principally what I do in my writing life and have been doing for the past 25, 30 years. And I, there's also this sense of trying to, this delicate balance between inside and outside. And I had a recurrent dream as a child of the, my, my shoulder being lifted up and having the, the outside world being poured in. So um, there's something about making, you know, fr coming to some sort of uh, balance with that and how that's kind of this sense of this big world inside and how to get that outside. So this, the scope of the long poem was always attractive to me in terms of this, my own psychic rhythms or something. One had poems read to one as a young child and that oral bias, what bias was imprinted. I often evoke the rare pleasure of sitting around a campfire and telling stories or reading poetry. I recommend we unplug and get back to this wonderful, timeless ritual. One has the narrative of the story as you're sitting there sort of around the, the fire with the flames. You're watching the images dance in the flames and you see things and you're sort of scrying at the same time, reading uh, images through the, the colors and shapes. Uh, this fantastic shape-shifting faces, bodies, animals, people, landscapes in this fluid, magical, ephemeral light. And sometimes the narrative will break this story or narration and the action or emotion becomes so strong that the language sort of soars into poetry mm -hmm. or song or mm -hmm. performance. And so I love that blending of genres this allows, this kind of storytelling or narrative kind of hybrid, the unpredictability of that form. Uh, when I worked in Indonesia, uh, I worked for a time with our study abroad programs at Naropa University. And working in Indonesia, I witnessed all night ritual performances with text and song and music and dance and, and presenters, even actors, uh, perf you know, these kind of hybrid performers. These were often outdoors with firelight and lanterns to better see the action by. Sometimes the narration was interrupted by a battle with demons and monsters and other warring factions and other agons of psychic life and death would intervene. And sometimes the poem would end, you'd leave and, and go as, in a kind of, uh, you know, procession to the charnel ground, to the burial ground. There'd be this final thing at, at dawn on occasion. Uh, but passion, jealousy, obsession all might have a hand in this, this long ritual uh, event. And the long poem always seemed to cover a huge span of power and possibility that, were, that was like this sort of ritual things I was observing. I would also watch the faces of these young children at these performances, sort of like the campfire experience, and, which were riveted and magnetized and, um, you know, and, and in, in tune and often moving sometimes in, in tune with the uh, chant or rhythm or incantation and the rise and fall of language in these different mm -hmm. sort of formations. And then I've writ witnessed other kinds of performances uh, with, with poetry, music, dance in India involving words, chant, mudras, or gestures, uh, lama dancing in Tibet, which was often a ceremony for making medicine. Uh, there's the Kutiyatam from southern India as an example of a sort of epic theater involving very subtle gestures and vocalizations highlighted by drum. Anyway, these, these practices of poetics that seem ancient, enduring, and embedded in a mythical and magical and timeless consciousness that might literally go on for days. There's also um, 
I've been editing a book that includes an essay by Allen Ginsberg talking about his experiences in Australia, in Arnhem Land, and he talks about this Australian Aboriginal tri tribal practice. It's the Pit Jun Jara tongue, which where to become a songman, a kind of griot, really, a songman, you memorize epic material that covers a cycle of 20 to 40 uh, years, like a migration uh, uh, cycle. And this involves constant traveling. So the, the poem itself is, so, uh, re recounts this traveling so that the wand this wandering epic would invoke the beauty of the terrain, you might find where you might find a water hole, where you'd find food, what the landmarks are, and the history and struggle and life of the place. And from another perspective, perhaps more scholarly, but one in agreement about the length of the epic, you have uh, Samuel Taylor Coleridge writing, quote, I should not think of devoting less than 20 years to the epic poem, 10 to collect materials and warm my mind with ununiversal science. I would be a tolerable mathematician. I would thoroughly know mathematics, hydrostatics, optics, and astronomy, <laughs> botany, metallurgy, fossilism, chemistry, geology, anatomy, medicine, then the mind of man, then the minds of men in all travels, voyages, histories. So I would spend 10 years, the next five, to the composition of the poem, and then the five last years to the correction of it. So I would write happily, not unhearing of that divine and nightly whispering voice which speaks to mighty minds of predestined garlands, starry and unwithering. It's a tall order which I heeded to some extent in my own practice, specifically with this Eovis uh, long trilogy, um, especially around travels, voyages, histories, a little bit of uh, astronomy and anatomy, but you know, as for math, forget it. Um, <laughs> So this, this long poem, the Ovis Trilogy, I-O-V-I-S, and I got my title from a, um, a line doing this sort of experiment where you open up Virgil. Uh, John Ashbery has, has used this sometimes to, I think, find poem titles, and you just strike a, a, you know, a, a phrase or sentence, and I came up with Iovis, Iovis omnia plena, all is full of Jove. I thought this is the title for my feminist, patriarchal, you know, anti-patriarchal epic. I'm going to take on the creator of the father. And the, and the joke was, you know, Jove, Zeus, who was constantly, you know, in, impregnating the world with his juice, his Zeus, um, you know, and making love with swans and, and uh, trees and so on. And, in any case, so the, there, would be, there was a little bit of a joke about all is full of Jove, and I was going to take that on in this um, trilogy. What, what I didn't know it was going to be a trilogy. I kind of had that in mind, kind of sort of ambitious form. And the subtitle is Colors in the Mechanism of Concealment. And so there's a sort of subtext there about, uh, um, you know, investigating all these political things and the nature of war, and there's a lot of uh, war in the, you know, taken on in here. So this feminist anti-war track that uh, honors and then takes on patriarchy, as it were, that I worked on for over 25 years, and I began writing it for my son and his generation when he was just five years old. It spans a lifetime of, my lifetime of, you know, this mid midlife, his, his birth, and you often begin an epic in media race, in the middle of things. Uh, Dante has that you know, great line of, in, my, in his, in his um, you know, I have the stepped uh, mid-motion in the middle of what we call our life. I looked up and saw no sky, only a dense cage of leaf, tree, and twig. I was lost. That's actually um, Mary Jo Bang's recent translation. But that sense of the middle of life. So I was mid-life, I had this child, and I, I tried, started to write it to understand my world better, and this, you know, the endless wars. Um, I was born right, you know, as my father was still serving in Germany, and I have a frontispiece in the book which shows him in his, his uniform. We're in Washington Square Park, and I'm fiddling with his buttons on his uniform, and I sort of, that's the luminous detail that started this whole poem, this obsession with, you know, understanding uh, the war and so on. Anyway, it spans this lifetime travel, investigations and study in India, Indonesia, China, Japan, seeking other structures of time and space, 
more circular and performative in strands from the lives of others, as well as homages to various males, uh, Alan, of course, John Cage, uh, the filmmaker Stan Brackage, and others who I see as breaking through certain confined tropes and strategies. So I wanted to honor some of these elders and then stomp on their corpses. No. Um, certain structural barriers with montage, with the strategies of cut up, uh, with the flickering firelight, as it were, and the sound that is subtle as the plucking of cactus needles, a great strategy of John Cage. And it was a concert of his where he was actually amplifying these uh, needles, cactus needles, and had this, there was this almost um, uh, very much like uh, Indi some of Indian music I was familiar with. So the Epico's form was the only one that could hold all I needed to write and construct to make sense of the world I lived in and help wake myself up to both its horror and its beauty. Dur during the composi composition of Iovis, which references, uh, as I said, this generative case of of Jove, uh, the possibility came with this long attraction to and reading of epics of other contours and place and dimension. Often intrigued by non-Western form, eschewed the constant reference back to traditional English poetry, and our American language is more of a hybrid itself. So the epic would be informed in part by a different lens of narrative, less linear, more circular, and I evoke the ALAP, A-L-A-P, ALAP from uh, Indian Raga that lays out the themes in an opening musical passage and then proceeds to improvise on these in the subsequent long form. I was interested in circular form, various uh, binaries that, be, that morph, um, and the Buddhist sense of 10 or 11 directions of space, of simultaneity actually, of, and disrupted modal structures. So there was the exciting and obligatory Homer, the dynamic Aeneid, the song of Roland in French from high school, the Kalevala, the Commedia, Gesar of Ling, which is a Tibetan epic, the Sumerian Inanna myth of travel to the underworld, stealing the father's secrets and return and so on. These were key generative texts. The lists and quotidian reality of Heshad's works and days, the Ramayana, Mahabharata, uh, Gilgamesh, Beowulf, the namings and lists in the Bible. Uh, Milton wrote his epics to justify the ways of God to man. Homer in the Iliad invokes the muse to sing of Achilles' Achilles's anger. I wrote to display my rage and lullaby to the world and um, you know, to justify the ways of woman to God or something like that. Epicos, epicus, world story, poem, usually a narrative that tells of heroic deeds and events significant to the culture of the nation. It is often, it often becomes the creation myth and history of that nation. Also saw as a reader, I could go to epics for history and rather, that were very different from the normal sort of master narratives, uh, historical master narratives. Somehow the, the poem had, had this, uh, these so many other dimensions and it felt like the true story. Um, the cosmological esoteric beliefs and so on, what people wore, what they dreamed of, who they loved, who were their demons, what barbarians haunted their sleep at the gates. I have two Viet uh, sections of Vietnam in this, in this poem, and the first was looking into some of the um, uh, mythology of the, the founding of, that, of, of the, the country and the north and south and this story of these twin uh, sisters. And then uh, later I was to go, actually go to Vietnam in 2000, which was the anniversary of the, what they call over there the American War, and just to go as a kind, in a kind of pilgrimage and as a witness, and then took notes, and so the, the notes form the, the canto. There are many, many, I don't know, 75 or something in this book of uh, sections, uh, which is called Dark Arcana After Imager Glow. And the, you know, the revelation there was that I was, there was nobody my age um, that I encountered. I, you know, m younger people born after the war and then a lot of elderly people uh, maimed and scarred by the war. So that was a very interesting um, way to, you know, think about the, the work. The, the work took over, this, this epic took over. So everything I was doing became, wasn't just grist for the mill, but became part of the, the, the narration. So that was just an example of kind of before and after, my sense of, uh, you know, from this, historical point of view, something about uh, Vietnam, and then I include in the first section the LBJ, LBJ, how many, you know, and the anti-war stuff that people were doing, and then the second was, you know, this, this 20, 
sort of referring to something uh, 25 years later, just as one example of the, of the way you can come back around and, and keeping in mind that, that idea of a, a wandering um, epic. So again, the media race in the middle of things at midpoint. Um, and at the opening of my poem, I invoke this Judeo-Christian patriarch as, as a kind of invocation. And uh, though he comes as a sorrowful one, the poet feminist narrator sees this as a trick to inspire pity, which turns to subjugation. She talks about staking a claim as Moses did with his tablets. She will write a new book for a new time. She will imitate, play prophet, and write these allegories on judgment day as only a woman might. So as I said in the beginning, I, was try I, I needed this form to uh, explore a, a certain span of history that was, and, and again, I felt it as a, a homage to for something for my child. And in my obsession with uh, archive, I think of this, this book as a kind of archive. And then within these time frames, there were also shorter, long poems, you know, like 100-page poems, the Marriage of Sentence, a serial poem, the recent Gossip Murmur and Structure of the World and um, Manatee Humanity, which was a, you know, a, an invitation from an actual manatee to tell her uh, story in some way. Okay, I'll stop.